from a top secret location. It's the spies who love me, bringing together MeTV's top super spies to fight evil at a memorable moment's notice. They're daring. That's right. Brave. Now what are we gonna do? The best we can. Swab. Does that apply to me, Oscar? Possibly. And smart? The old finger in the gun trick. Maxwell Smart. Me TV Fresno, channel 43.6 and Xfinity 187. Frigidaire. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigidaire Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. Hi, I'm John Malos. Welcome to this live edition of Connect With Me on the showroom floor at Ventura TV on this Monday morning. It's on the air, off the presses. A lot to talk about with our special guest here today uh, over the phone and in the studio. That's right. One of our media analysts is here today to talk about ICE and immigration and much more. You can join the conversation, 436-MeTV, option 11, back in a moment. <laughs> the program on a Monday morning. It's on the air off the presses. We'll have somebody from the Business Journal in here, our usual guest, our media analyst. Hope you had a great weekend. Hey, it's time to remind you, my friends, we got a week full of great shows coming your way all this Monday through Friday, all this week. And uh, you can catch us each Monday through Friday live on Comcast, channel 187, 43.6, 13.1, and now 8.1 four stations in all live between 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning. Then you can catch us live. Uh, actually, the tape version comes at 2 o'clock, 13.6 uh, YouTube, 8 o'clock tonight, 4.6 Biz TV. The Twitter account is simple. Hasn't changed at John Mallows, uh, me TV. So a lot to get to here. We're going to talk to uh, Sheriff Mims in just a moment here by telephone. And uh, I, I, I want to intro this by talking about immigration. And it's a move by the Fresno County Sheriff, uh, Margaret Mims, that's already sparked a ton of controversy. It has to do with ICE, immigration, customs, and enforcement. Let's roll the videotape, show you exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, she is on the hot seat right now. A pilot program is now in place, implemented last month by the Sheriff's Department. Two ICE agents are stationed inside the Fresno County Jail to determine whether or not those who have been arrested are here legally. And they take a look at their background, they check their criminal history before, uh, before deciding if these individuals should in fact be deported. Immigrant supporters rallied in downtown Fresno last week saying this is a slap in the face and it further erodes the trust between immigrants and law enforcement. On the flip side, Mim says this has no effect on those immigrants who are here legally and they are not committing crimes. In other words, if you're here working, you keep your nose clean, you got nothing to worry about. Controversy over ICE escalated last year or last uh, month after a court ruling uh, ruled that an immigrant woman had her Fourth Amendment rights violated. And the issue was brought uh, to light again last month when a San Francisco woman was murdered along Pier 14, allegedly shot by an undocumented immigrant who had been deported five times. Now, local authorities are supposed to report to the feds, in this case ICE, when it uh, comes to illegals, but San Francisco is one of those cities, one of those so-called safe haven cities. ICE is part of Homeland Security. Live in our studio right now is Gabriel Dillard from the Fresno Business Journal, and on the telephone is Fresno County Sheriff Margaret Mims. Good morning, Gabriel. Good morning, Sheriff Mims. Are you there? I am here. Good morning. Hi. Let me get your reaction, first of all, and then secondly to that, are those two ICE 
deputies, are they still stationed at the Fresno County Jail? Uh, yes. The, first of all, the, the group protesting, are a, it's an open border group, and they travel the state and protest at different um, jails uh, as well as legislators. So that, that's what they do. Um, believe me, the feedback I've gotten is much more positive than it is negative. Now, the ICE agents remain in the jail, uh, and again, I want to emphasize something you, you mentioned we're not targeting people going out into communities and doing immigration sweeps. Uh, we are concentrating on people arrested. ICE determines whether or not uh, the people that are here illegally fit into the priority one or priority two uh, enforcement plan that they've established. That means they only target people who have multiple deportations, like the man in uh, San Francisco, or multiple crimes, again, like uh, the man in San Francisco that murdered uh, the young woman. So this is the best way I believe we can work together to keep our communities as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, Sheriff Mims, this is uh, Gabriel Dillard. I uh, just wanted to ask what sorts of, of crimes, uh, if you could tell us, have people who have been deported through this program committed? Um, what kind of people have, have already been um, sent away through this program? Sure. The priority one and priority two are um, people that belong to either a terrorist group, criminal street gangs, have committed uh, significant felonies. That's the priority one. The priority twos are if they've committed uh, or been convicted of three or more significant misdemeanors or have been deported numerous times. That, that's their standard. Yeah, much like the uh, suspect, of course, in San Francisco, he was deported five times. So in order to, to be deported uh, out of the country, an immigrant uh, who is here, from not from a legal standpoint, has to commit, what, three misdemeanors and a felony? Or, or how does that work again? Well, this, if you, uh, you can Google this, but ICE uh, Priority Enforcement Program, they call it PET. Right. Uh, they categorize uh, one, two, and three priorities. Uh, our local ICE office is only targeting priority one and priority two inmates. Uh, so they are getting the worst of the worst. So priority one, obviously, would be a felony, right? Uh, a absolutely. And yeah. they take a look at not just their current charge, but then take a look at their prior criminal history. Well, okay, now at the top you mentioned that you're getting more positive feedback than negative. Uh, there was a lot of publicity, of course, about this in the Fresno Bee in the last uh, couple of weeks. Much of it was negative. Um, you know, why do you think that is? Why do you think that some of the publicity is negative? Uh, is it because it appears that, that ICE is targeting immigrants? And the second part of that question is, how do you think law enforcement is working with federal agents like ICE, not only across the state, but across the country? Well, our, our pilot project, I believe, is a model. Um, after 9-11, um, the communication between local law enforcement and uh, federal agencies greatly improved. Out of necessity, uh, there were some shortcomings discovered as a result of that terrorist attack. Uh, so we, out of necessity, started communicating much better uh, with our federal partners. Now, the conundrum for California sheriffs is we have the Trust Act, which prohibits sheriffs from holding certain uh, inmates uh, for certain crimes. And then the Oregon case that you mentioned, where a ICE detainer is just a request. There's no legal authority for sheriffs to hold somebody beyond the time when they normally would be released. So the common sense solution was to put ICE in the jail for them to make that determination. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the San Francisco case, why was there a breakdown between federal and local authorities? I thought they were supposed to be working together. And it seems to be more commonplace across the country that local authorities are not working with ICE to try to rectify the problem with, with those illegals who are committing crimes. Well, in San Francisco, they are a sanctuary city. And in fact, the suspect of this murder said he went to San Francisco just because of that reason. 
Uh, and I, I believe that, you know, no other country in the world would allow people from somewhere else to come here, commit crimes, and stay here. And we shouldn't either. Um, Sheriff Mims, uh, I have a question. Uh, but what happens to those folks who are um, uh, they're booked into the county jail? Uh, maybe their legal status is, is unknown. Um, th does ICE check everybody whose who's status is unknown? And even if they don't have that violent background, um, what happens to them? Is there still a case that's maybe, you know, they're not immediately deported, but, you know, is there, is there a case initiated at that point? Um, my question to ICE is what, why, how do you uh, avoid, you know, the profiling issue? Uh, and they said they check everybody. And when they came in, they do, in fact, check everybody. Uh, and then the next thing they check is where do they fit in their priority enforcement program, their PEP program. Are they priority one or priority twos? I see. Okay. Um, you mentioned the case last year that took place in Oregon. In your opinion, uh, and it doesn't have to be an opinion, it has to be fact uh, in terms of law, do illegal immigrants, uh, do they have, can, can they be protected under the Fourth Amendment, Fourth Amendment rights? Yes, that's already been decided. Okay. Does that hinder or help uh, the program here in Fresno in terms of, of working in conjunction with ICE? Well, it doesn't hinder our current process with having ICE inside the jail. It, if they weren't inside the jail, it would hinder us in, t in locating people that might be dangerous uh, because I would have no legal authority to hold them at ICE's request. Let me ask you, Sheriff Mims, as long as I got you on the phone, what do you think about Donald Trump's comments about immigrants? You, you know what he said. Uh, it sparked a lot of controversy. Uh, in fact, outrage among the Hispanic community uh, across the country. What, what are your thoughts? Well, it was very polarizing, and, and I think um, you can be pro-immigration reform like I am. I truly believe uh, we need to reform our current immigration uh, program and policies uh, because it's not, it's not good for anybody. It's, we're sending some mixed messages. It needs to be clarified. We need to give people a way that's efficient, that they can be here legally should they want to. As sheriff, I want to know where people are and, and, who, and who they are. What we have are people here illegally who are actually preying on other people who are here illegally. And those, those folks that are here working very hard, trying to earn a living, not committing crimes, we need to figure out a way to give them some kind of status so that they're not afraid of law enforcement. Do you think that ICE and this um, um, working relationship with the people here in Fresno, do you think it erodes the trust between immigrants and law enforcement, or do you think it helps? Well, I think it helps because it, it uh, only targets those who are here committing crimes. Yeah. So, uh, again, the message, and I've done several interviews with uh, Spanish TV saying we do not target victims of crime. We have to encourage people to report. Because, again, they are being preyed upon by other people who are here illegally and will threaten them using their status. If you report, we'll, we will tell ICE that you're here illegally. Sheriff, have there been any incidents here in Fresno County that you're aware of that, that might have been prevented if they had this, this project, this pilot program been in place before? Um, we know that we've had multiple bookings of individuals um, that have uh, committed uh, crimes multiple times. Uh, I don't have those names with me, but we do have uh, people that um, we've rearrested. Yeah. Any deportations recently? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question for ICE because they do what they do. There's, there's many databases that they have access to that we don't. So they have a, a clearer idea of prior criminal history of some of these people that we don't have access to. And yeah. so that's a really good question for ICE, and I believe they're doing interviews also. Okay. Sheriff Mims, we appreciate your time. We know you're on the way to an appointment, and uh, you've created quite a controversy here. I know you were on Fox News, the, the national Fox News channel. When was it? Last week? You were on Fox and Friends, right, talking about this? Yes, Fox and Friends. And uh, what I hear from ICE is we have several jurisdictions now in California looking to try and replicate this program. 
Um, you know, our, our job is to keep people as safe as possible, and this particular program helps make that happen. All right, Sheriff Mims, always appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us, and have a good day. You bet. All right, thank you. We're going to be back with more of our show here on Connect With Me. We're going to continue talking with Gabriel Dillard about a number of topics right here in the city of Fresno. We might even talk about ICE on a continuing basis here during the course of the program. Hey, if you want to call in and weigh in, you have a question, you have a comment about ICE and what uh, the Sheriff's Department is doing, you heard what the Sheriff had to say. Uh, she hopes that this uh, model here is one that the nation can take a look at and copy and follow. Back with your phone calls in just a moment. At 2020 Optometric, your vision is their focus. Whether you're 5 or 65, Dr. Thomas Casagrande will get to know you, your lifestyle, and vision needs to ensure that your contacts or eyeglasses are a perfect fit and the right prescription every time. With the Valley's largest selection of eyewear, 2020 has over 2,000 frames, including top designer brands like Coach, Tiffany, Prada, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and more. Eye exams start as low as $89, so call or stop by to schedule your appointment today. Hello, I'm John Walsh. We need your help to capture this fugitive. Julio Cesar Guevara Mejia is wanted by the FBI in Sacramento for the attempted murder of a 19-year-old female in November of 2007. Police say he lured the young woman to a hotel room where he shot her three times in the chest. He could be in Palm Springs, California or Houston, Texas. Contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI if you have any information. We're back here on the program talking about ICE and talking about immigration, talking about Sheriff Margaret Mims and a lot more to get to besides that topic here uh, today with Gabriel Dillard. Glad you're here on a Monday morning. How are you? Oh, I'm great. <laughs> Thank you for having me, John. Hey, I appreciate it. What do you think of Margaret Mims and her uh, comments? Um, I, I think she, it's great that she had the time to call in and, and discuss something that's obviously hit a nerve in uh, the community. Um, uh, you know, personally, I, I don't think anybody should be on the streets who has a background of violent crime. And, um, you know, but I, I could understand the controversy of the, uh, of, of the, the program, too. Yeah, I'm not quite sure because, you know, I, obviously we've read some of the reports uh, in the Fresno Bee. Mims was on Fox uh, News Channel last week. She was on KMPH. And, um, you know, immigrants look at this as the... the, the, the you know, the trust being eroded between immigrants and law enforcement, I guess there's already that tension there, and they're saying that this further erodes it. I'm not sure that that's true because whether someone is a legal immigrant, an illegal immigrant, a natural born citizen, if they're committing a crime, they're committing a crime. And if they're illegal, maybe they should be deported. Yeah, that's true, but you, you know, there's probably people who are going into the jail for committing you know very minor crimes. Maybe it's a, a warrant for not paying tickets, you know. And, and in that case, those folks uh, have the unfortunate uh, luck of being, you know, I'm sure they did something to to come under suspicion. But you know, there's varying degrees of crime, and and just to maybe if I fail to pay some tickets and I'll, I get booked into the jail and I get released. 20 minutes later and then the legacy might be that ICE has a case against me. And but I think the sheriff was also talking about serious crimes like felonies. There's a level one and a mm -hmm. level two and then ICE determines whether or not they deport them. Yeah and those are the folks getting deported but we don't know about the folks that aren't getting deported and what's happening to them. Is, is that just um, uh, you know is that encounter going to be erased from the record or you know that was my question to, to Sheriff Mims is was what happens to the folks who aren't in those serious categories. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, we don't hear about them, but ICE is conducting interviews, and I'm mm -hmm. going to try to get someone, uh, try to book somebody here on the program from ICE to talk about their program and what they're doing with these illegals. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Caller? Uh, let me direct that question to Gabriel. Yeah, uh, to Gabriel. Uh, yeah. What, uh, what I don't like about ICE is, you know, they go into areas that they know that there's going to be uh, a lot of illegal But I do feel that they should go into uh, uh, places uh, where they'll be on the field work and just to check to see who's, who's uh, getting out. Now they're protected, but at the same time, you can find out who are a lot of criminals 
I know a few of them that that work on the fields. I'm not, and I'm not just just a final. Or I'm I'm like I said, but we need to get a lot of uh, uh, criminals off off the streets. You know. So I think what I should do, and I don't know how they work the thing. They, they just kind of uh, by random go into the fields or go into the companies that that they know that there's a lot of uh, activity as far as criminals and all that. And then take it from there. I, I, I'm an Hispanic, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was born here, but there at the same time, uh, that, that's a question I leave to you. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it matters whether or not you're Hispanic or, or white or Asian or what race or in ethnicity you are. I think it matters whether or not these people are committing crimes. And if ICE's job is that when someone is arrested, she has two ICE officers stationed at the jail. So they're checking on these people to see if they're here legally or not. And they're trying to check out to see what kind of crimes they've been charged with. So I think that's how, that's how the program pretty much works, as I understand it. So why is there so much controversy about that? Look at the guy in San Francisco, undocumented, gets deported five times. There he is right there. Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez comes back through Arizona twice, comes through Texas twice. Why wasn't this guy stopped? I mean, I know San Francisco's a safe haven city. There are more than a hundred safe haven cities across the country, but I, I still don't understand why the ICE project is so controversial when they're checking on criminal backgrounds. I think it's it's the the immigration rights community that is seeing that uh, there's implicit uh, cooperation there between Fresno County and ICE. Um, yeah, uh, you have criminals, uh, violent criminals who are getting picked up, but I think what their concern is is just the regular folks who might get entangled in this, and maybe it's a slippery slope sort of argument. Where where do you stop? Where do you stop? I mean, do you start do enforcing you know out in the fields? Um, you know, does ICE go and do random checks? I, you know, it's been done before, but I bet you if they did it today, there'd be a lot of angry growers. Um, yeah, in this particular case, they're not out on the fields. They're yeah. in a jail, specifically, where, where people are, you know, fingerprinted. They're booked for crimes they've been charged with, not necessarily convicted of. And so, um, you know, they're not out on the fields, like, uh, checking on people's status or papers or anything like that. They're, that's not happening here in the Central Valley. Yeah, but, but you know, maybe their concern is, where, where does it stop? I mean, that's what your caller suggested, is maybe th that I should do that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I see both both sides of it. I, you know, it's hard to have sympathy for people who get arrested and, and are put in jail. Right. Um, but... You know, that, like you mentioned, they haven't been convicted of crimes. It's just suspicion. Exactly. We're going to talk more about this. Uh, 436 Me TV Option 11. If you want to call in and weigh in, today's program is sponsored by Dr. Thomas Casagrande. He's the owner of 2020 Optometrics, located out there at Shaw and Blackstone. We're back in just a moment. At 2020 Optometric, your vision is their focus. Whether you're 5 or 65, Dr. Thomas Casagrande will get to know you, your lifestyle, and vision needs to ensure that your contacts or eyeglasses are a perfect fit and the right prescription every time. With the Valley's largest selection of eyewear, 2020 has over 2,000 frames, including top designer brands like Coach, Tiffany, Prada, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and more. Eye exams start as low as $89, so call or stop by to schedule your appointment today. Want to create something extraordinary? Create perfection. Our lifestyle appliances make it easy. KitchenAid, Ventura TV Appliance and you, when only the best will do. The Ballad of Andy and Barney. Andy and Barney were lawmen, bravest you ever did see. Warned ever crook in the record book to stay out of Mayberry. They were the law. Yes, they were the law, and, and they didn't, didn't know fear. The Andy Griffith Show. I guess to sum it up, you could say there's three reasons why there's so little crime in Mayberry. There's Andy, and there's me. And baby makes three. 
<laughs> now on Me TV Fresno. Back here on the program on Connect With Me on a Monday morning, we're talking about ICE and, um, you know, the, the, the case in San Francisco. And uh, Kate Steinle is the woman who was shot and killed. She took some bullets to the back as she was walking along Pier 14. And Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez is the man responsible for killing her. And just to kind of refresh your memory, this, memory, this is what sparked the entire controversy uh, as to what happened in San Francisco. And let's take a look at that report now and kind of refresh our memory as to what happened last month on Pier 14. Did you shoot Kate Steinle, the lady who was down on Pier 14? Yes. In a jailhouse interview, undocumented immigrant Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez admitted to seeing an affiliate KGO that he killed a woman on a San Francisco pier. You did shoot her. 32-year-old mm -hmm. Kate Steinle was killed. Lopez Sanchez claims the shooting was an accident, that he was wandering on Pier 14 after taking sleeping pills, and he found a gun wrapped in a T-shirt that went off when he picked it up. Hear that boom, boom. Three times. According to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, Lopez Sanchez has seven prior felony convictions and has been deported to Mexico five times. Lopez Sanchez tells KGO he came back to San Francisco because it's a so-called sanctuary city where local authorities would not detain him solely because of his immigration status. Yes, sir, right here. Homeland Security Director Jay Johnson reacting to the shooting vowed to improve the department's focus. We want to work more effectively with state and local jurisdictions uh, to get at people who are threats to public safety, who are undocumented, who we should be focusing our resources on deporting. The shooting comes just weeks after Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's controversial statements on Mexican immigrants. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. In a statement Friday, Trump said Steinle's death was yet another example of why we must secure our border immediately, adding that it is a disgraceful situation and, quote, I am the only one that can fix it. Trump's rivals reacted to his comments on Mexican immigrants on the Sunday talk shows. Are there some people who come with uh, nefarious goals? Yes, that's why we need to secure the border. But I would never besmirch all the people who come here. I don't think we should, can sugarcoat that, but that doesn't mean that everybody who's coming across is, uh, is a rapist or a murderer or anything else. In a statement to CNN, I says city law enforcement did not honor an earlier detainer request for Lopez Sanchez. If the local authorities had merely notified ICE that they were about to release this individual into the community, ICE could have taken custody of him, thus preventing this terrible tragedy. The San Francisco Sheriff's Department says it is deeply saddened by the death, adding that city ordinance deemed Sanchez eligible for release. That ordinance dismisses immigration detainers as a sole reason for holding prisoners. And just kind of refreshing our memory as to what happened, and we should not forget what happened in San Francisco. And hopefully, you know, there, there are obviously some loopholes here. Um, you know, people like uh, this guy Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez slipping through the cracks. How could that happen? Right, I mean, and, and there's always uh, consequences when when a city or, or you know like San Francisco makes the decision not to cooperate with with federal authorities. I mean, it's obviously San Francisco is a liberal place compared to Fresno, extremely liberal, but. Sooner or later, something like this was, was bound to happen, and uh, it, I think that it's time to have that dialogue, you know. Yeah, well, the, th the, the, the incident that happened in San Francisco kind of defies logic. It defies common sense for someone to come into the country, be deported five times. You saw in that report seven felonies this man committed. He's allowed to come back in and commit a, a, a murder. Um, an innocent woman is taken, and so it kind of defies logic in a way, doesn't it? A little bit. Uh, yeah, it does, and, and you know, it probably says something about our criminal justice system. You know, how are people able to commit felony after felony, let alone an illegal immigrant? You know, at, at some point, when when does this this stuff catch up with them? When do they get thrown in prison or, or you know deported? I'd, I think it says a lot about just the way the system works these days, yeah. too. Hey, we're going to move on to another topic here, and I want to talk about the Confederate flag. Let's roll a videotape from South Carolina. This took place a few weeks ago when the flag came down, and then you know what happened 
uh, here in the city of Fresno, Gabe. There was the ceremony that took place in South Carolina. The flag had flown in front of the state house there more than 50 years. It finally came down. There was a woman there in South Carolina uh, that prior to this ceremony, she actually climbed the flagpole herself and <laughs> took it down. Um, and kind of a random act there. Um, and, uh, you know, this, all, this issue traveled all the way to Fresno in the city council, and so they banned the sale of the flag or flying the flag at city hall and government property. The question I have is, okay, the city council did this, but aren't there more pressing issues than the Confederate flag in Fresno? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's definitely more going on in the city. I think a lot of people reacted that way. Um, I'm sure most people would agree that any sort of symbol that people see as being representing racism should right. should not be glorified, especially in a place like here where there's really no sort of heritage there. You know, maybe people who from for, from the South have moved here, but, you know, that symbol is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what, what it, if it represents something that's offensive to people, then you should think about it, uh, flying it. But uh, I agree with you. I don't know if this was exactly something that the city council needed to, to, to spend some time on. And yeah, I think it was a waste of time because the Confederate flag, number one, is not flying in front of City Hall. It's not flying at the state capitol in San, uh, Sacramento. It's not flying in Los Angeles. I don't see it anywhere in California. In fact, um, you know, I, I have not ever seen the Confederate flag in Fresno anywhere. I don't know if you could even go to Walmart and buy it or Target and buy it. So. It, was it more just a symbolic gesture? I don't know. I think that's that's really all you can look at it is, is like a symbolic gesture. Um, some people might call it, um, you know, a political ploy, a way to, to get some attention. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, it, it did. It got attention. It was in the paper. It was on all the news stations. Um, it, it just it sets off, you know, some issues with the city, you know. Uh, there's the Civil War reenactment at Kearney Park, and that that's uh, a county property, but I'm sure that the Confederate flag flies during that event just to honor kind of the historical accuracy. So what would happen if, if somebody wanted to do such an event at the city? Um, right. it, how, how is this is this a measure on a, a stable ground constitutionally? I, I don't know. Obviously... The city's lawyers might have vetted it, but yeah, who but knows? you've never seen the Confederate flag outside maybe that that Civil War reenactment that takes place every year. Have you ever what? seen anybody fly the Confederate flag in Fresno? Not to my recollection. You you see stuff on social media like oh this is you know Clovis has the Confederate yeah. flag flying <laughs> or a swastika yeah. or whatever in Clovis. Yeah, you see that on social media. Yeah, and I think people, you know, choose to 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 fly that symbol and you know for whatever reason they do it. Um, maybe it's just to get a rise out of folks. I don't know, but you you see it. You know, I don't. I wouldn't say it, it's out of out of sight in public, but yeah, I've, yeah. I've never seen the city. You know, when has the city ever sold a Confederate flag? You it, know, it I, never, I, and it's never yeah. flown in front of City Hall, <laughs> and it never will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're not the South, and so, I don't know, a lot of wasted ink by the Fresno Bee, a lot of publicity uh, on this story, and maybe even the city council, who knows, um, you know, wasted some precious time. Uh, but I don't know, that's just... I mean, that's that's up for debate, right? 436, Me TV Option 11. We're going to come back after this brief time out. Uh, after this word from Thomas Casagrande, our sponsor today here on the program. Hello, I'm John Walsh. We need your help to capture this fugitive. Francisco Molina Nieve has been on the run since March 2008. The police and the FBI need your help tracking this coward down. He's wanted for brutally beating his girlfriend and for the use of a firearm. He has three freckles and a crescent shape under his right eye. Call the Colorado FBI at 303-629-7171 if you know where he's hiding. At 2020 Optometric, your vision is their focus. Whether you're 5 or 65, Dr. Thomas Casagrande will get to know you, your lifestyle, and vision needs to ensure that your contacts or eyeglasses are a perfect fit and the right prescription every time. With the Valley's largest selection of eyewear, 2020 has over 2,000 frames, including top designer brands like Coach, Tiffany, Prada, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and more. Eye exams start as low as $89, so call or stop by to schedule your appointment today.
Yeah, and here's the other question I have as far as the Confederate flag is concerned. We're just talking here on the set about Lee uh, Brand and uh, Steve Brandau abstaining from the vote on the Confederate flag. I mean, if you're going to abstain, then what are you on the council for? You're on the council so you can vote on issues. I mean, whether it's significant, insignificant, if it's up for a vote, for God's sake, vote on it. Right? That's what you're getting paid for. Yeah. That's what it, you got elected for. It was perfectly crafted, or if you were to vote against it, then you would be in a world of, of pain. And, you know, they, they chose the most politically expedient way to deal with it. Yeah. Have some guts. Vote. <laughs> That's why you're there. Let's roll the videotape. Uh, trucks catching fire in California. Apparently, this is a problem here. And let me hold up the Business Journal. It's right here. It's a front page this week of the Business Journal uh, here in Fresno. Let me let me talk about what this is all about. And really, the State Attorney General's office is kind of coming under fire right, right now from certain groups, or one group, for ignoring a rash of recent truck fires, claiming they were sparked by a faulty diesel particulate filter. What about these filters, and are they causing these fires, Gabe, from what you understand? Uh, there's a group called the uh, Alliance for California Business. They're based up in Chico up north. Uh, they have about 400 members, and they're really pushing this. They've actually sued in Glen County to uh, get an injunction against uh, truckers having to use these filters. Uh, the filters are used uh, to meet clean air standards. Actually, about three years ago is, I think, when they started uh, phasing in. So... Um, so yeah, you know we we haven't had any reports of any truck fires related to this uh, in the Central Valley. There, I guess there was one day out on 156 near San Juan Batista where like four of these trucks caught on fire like in the same day in the same stretch of road. Just out of the blue, they can catch fire, or when uh, does it happen? Well, when they come to a stop, or while they're driving, or what? Apparently, these filters get white hot when they're when they're going. Um, so if you if you come in contact with uh, some sort of accelerant like fuel or something, it, it, they could go up. Wow. Um, the thing is, this alliance, uh, they're, they're pushing uh, the California Air Resources Board. That's the agency who's uh, put these rules in the place. And, and they're trying to get them to investigate this. And um, they're, they're running up against some problems doing that. They're trying to get incident reports, accident reports um, from, like, the CHP on, on this. But they've been blocked from, from really kind of getting a causal uh, r relationship with, with what happened. Um, but we, we we spoke to some local uh, truck uh, trucking firms and uh, like they said they haven't reported any fires but there's one guy who maybe three or four times he's had these things actually uh, cause one of his uh, trucks to just stop working and he's had to to get uh, somebody to come out and tow it and, the, and he said the bills are kind of piling up apparently they'll wow. they'll get yeah. uh, especially if you're idling for a while they'll get kind of packed with with this particulate matter and. Um, and that, that, that might also be a, an issue where the fire could, could set off. Something. Wow, and this is a pretty bad truck fire you're looking at right here. And the president of that uh, alliance that you're talking about, his name is Bud Caldwell. He formed the alliance a couple of years ago uh, to try to lead the charge to eliminate these filters. And, you know, if you get caught in a traffic jam, and I have on 99 coming back from, say, the Bay Area or Sacramento, and you can be stuck on 99 for for couple of hours and if you're sitting there idling in a truck boom this thing could catch fire um that that's what that's what these folks are saying wow. and, and i think what the thing is that they're trying to find out more you know they want to prove that these these fires are are, are being caused by these filters and they're running up against opposition from the, the air resources board board as well as uh, attorney general Kamala Harris. George Lurie of the Business Journal wrote a terrific article about this and let me hold this up, let me hold up, up the front page, it shows a picture of a truck on fire and he basically says that the, uh, the temperature in the engine, in the truck engine, can reach and exceed 600 degrees Celsius. Wow. White, white hot, yeah. Yeah. And, and the scary thing is, in, not only are these filters required for uh, uh, these, yeah, for, for like commercial tractors and trailers, but they're also required on school buses that are diesel, diesel powered school buses. Um, I don't know if, if uh, school buses are, are kind of running under the conditions that your long haul trucker would, but you know, there, there's plenty of reasons to, to look into this. I, I don't know if there's been any injuries uh, that the Alliance uh, didn't, didn't make it clear if there's any major injuries and God forbid that there ever is, but hopefully it won't.
it won't take that in order to, to take a closer look well, at it. In the article, George Lurie uh, alludes to that uh, many truckers have described being stuck on the side of the highway, having to take their trucks out of uh, service. And in Caldwell, the head of this alliance here, says that, uh, or at least he claims that at least 31 truck fires, all directing uh, and pointing the finger toward the filters in the last 18 months, 31 trucks have gone up in flames. Yeah, th those are startling numbers. And when, when uh, the alliance uh, went to a judge up north to get an injunction, the judge d decided not to uh, do away with the, the filter requirement. But he did say that, that some of this, um, some of these things are kind of concerning with, with the safety of these filters. So I, I think it'll warrant. Is this going to end up in court again? Um, I, I don't know. I, it's very possible, I think. And, and then all this is, is based up north. So, you know, there's a pretty big trucking industry here in the valley that was pretty much opposed to these filters from the start, but I've never heard them discuss fires. So uh, especially if something happens up here, I, I think you see a lot more truckers joining in, in the chorus of, of all right, wanting uh, Quickly, to before this. we go to break here, um, are truckers and the general public being put at risk? Uh, I think if you were to believe what this alliance is saying, um, it's definite. You know, it's a definite risk. You know, we saw that video of uh, the, the fires on uh, I-15 the other day. Yeah. Those, I mean, you you imagine that um, you're in you're in traffic and and a truck goes up and you're stuck. You know, that that's uh, that's a nightmare scenario. And and Horrible. if and if these filters are um, to uh, to blame, maybe it's maybe it's the the trucking industry is not doing enough to maintain these filters. I don't know, but whatever it is, if there's a possibility that these fires could happen, it should be addressed. Yeah. Terrific story in the Business Journal, and here it is, right here, written by George Lurie. We're going to talk about other topics and other issues uh, here on the program today. In fact, let me ask you a question, my friends. Who do you think is buying the majority? of cars these days, the majority of cars, specifically Lexus, all right? The numbers are rather startling. If you believe the article in the Business Journal, it's quite quite hair-raising, my friends. And you can call in and weigh in at 436-MEAN-TV, option 11. In the meantime, our program sponsored today by Dr. Thomas Casagrande of 2020 Optometrics. Tune in to Heartland for the best in true country music. Relive vintage specials, one-of-a-kind concerts, and country music's earliest videos. Heartland is the heart of country. The only place where you can find country music, country stars, and country lifestyles 24-7. Heartland, the heart of country. Now on channel 13.2. At 2020 Optometric, your vision is their focus. Whether you're 5 or 65, Dr. Thomas Casagrande will get to know you, your lifestyle, and vision needs to ensure that your contacts or eyeglasses are a perfect fit and the right prescription every time. With the Valley's largest selection of eyewear, 2020 has over 2,000 frames, including top designer brands like Coach, Tiffany, Prada, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and more. Eye exams start as low as $89, so call or stop by to schedule your appointment today. Back here on the program, uh, my friends, I want to roll the videotape and let's uh, roll the tape from Fresno Lexus because, you know, we're going to talk a little bit today about Lexus and that Fresno dealership out there in North Fresno. It's out at, on near Palm and Herndon. And the general manager out there, Karen Myers, says that women are more likely to respond to extra effort and remember how they're treated. She's talking about car buying, and can you believe that 68% of all new cars accounted for are purchased by women? Women, Gabe. <laughs> yeah, they're they're uh, the. It's a changing world, and consumers are uh, are led by by women. You know, most of the time, maybe women are making the the purchasing decisions in the house. Maybe they're making all the money. Yeah, maybe they're making all the money. You know, and and they're still the you know the women not making as much as men but um right it's definitely happening i think another another statistic was by like 2020 two-thirds of all consumer wealth will, will be in the hands of women which that's it'll but change there's nothing wrong with that i'm oh, not no. saying there's anything wrong with that i just found that number to be kind of startling 
and it also goes down to say that um, you know by 2025 the information firm uh, predicts this information firm that was uh, quoted here in the business journal says that women will hold 66 percent of all consumer wealth which you just mentioned uh, just a moment ago but is this 68 percent limited to Lexus or does that include all cars across the board I believe that's all cars across the board um, mm -hmm. Karen Meyer said specifically for the the Fresno Lexus dealership that 49 percent of buyers are women mm -hmm. which is pretty much an even split um, and you know traditionally you would assume that it was kind of more of a man's domain to, to buy a car kick the yeah. tires sort of thing <laughs> uh, but but you know it's a changing world and, and that's part of why uh, Lexus is, is uh, training their their folks to better deal with women customers. Yeah, the article says here, which I think you alluded to already, in 2013, women accounted for 49% of all new Lexus purchases at the Fresno dealership. So if you go out there to Fresno Lexus, not only is the general manager a female, the people buying cars are females too. Now, uh, how is it? I know you're married. What's <laughs> what's going on there in your household? <laughs> well, you know, uh, my wife definitely makes a good amount of, of those decisions. Uh, we we actually just bought a car, and it, I could say it was kind of a compromise between the both of us. But uh -huh. um, you know, I, I would never. <laughs> I couldn't think of making a huge uh, kind of fiscal decision like that in the household without at least consulting my wife and. Um, yeah, maybe that's just how it is. Maybe there's just more, like, you know, women who maybe aren't married but that are making those decisions. I, I think it's just across the board. Um, right. And, and the, th the thing that I should mention here is that, you know, none of these cars uh, are cheap. Oh, no. You know, you go to Toyota, and you can get a low-end Toyota probably in the, in the low to mid-20s, okay? But you're, going to Le you're talking about Lexus? You're gonna. You're talking about mid 30s and up. Yeah, those I'm are talking 35,000 and up. Those are luxury cars. I mean, that's definitely a d different demographic than than what's normal. Um, right. But it sounds like uh, across all demographics, uh, more and more women are, are making those calls. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I don't know how many people. It'd be it'd be great to get the breakdown from Lexus. How many people are actually leasing as opposed to buying? That's true. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I, I, and I know that Lexus has also been kind of going after uh, lower price points to get people kind of onto the lot. Uh, BMW, Mercedes kind of doing a little bit of the same thing. So they're reaching out, you know, to maybe people who wouldn't normally think they could afford that sort of car, as well as was women. Who, who is Lexus competing against in terms of market? Um, well, I'd have to imagine is just any any luxury Beamer? car Would it be brand. Beamer? Uh, BMW. They're uh, kind of equivalent, right? I'd say so. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a luxury car list, and you know, the Jaguars on there. Um, you know, it's kind of limited what you could buy here in the valley as far as dealerships, but the, the low end Mercedes too, I think, are selling right around the same. Yeah, I think they're trying to get like in the high thirties, maybe is what their, their yeah. beginning price points are these days. Yeah, maybe the middle. so you have all those all those competing dealerships too. You got you know BMW, you've got the Mercedes, you've got uh, what did you mention? I forgot. Uh, uh, Jaguar. Jaguar. Yeah. Uh, that's right. You got the Jaguar dealership downtown here, mm -hmm. and then you've got you've got Lexus, and and those who say that Lexus is the same car as a Toyota, <laughs> you know, Karen Myers is going to disagree with you on that because she, you know, I was talking to her the other day, and she said, no, she said these cars are built in totally different factories, and they're a different car, and you know they might be owned by the same company, but it's like buying a, a Volkswagen and say a Mercedes. It's a different animal altogether so I don't know Gabe. yeah I don't know yeah and I think the lesson to take away is because what, what happened is Lexus actually got selected for this pilot program to, to train their sales and service staff uh, to, to deal with with women customers um, they're one of like I mentioned they're one of nine in the country that was selected for it so they're, they're undergoing this training and I think the lesson is if you're in a traditional uh, retail environment where it's maybe men might have been the, the customers in the past you, you might want to think about ways that you could cater more towards women. Uh, another company we spoke to was uh, called 511 Tactical. They're based out of Modesto, and they mm -hmm. make uh, tactical clothing, you know, for, like, police officers and stuff, and it's, you know, for the shooting community. And they're they're even coming out with a line of women's products, you know, like a hand uh, purse where you can hide your, 
your concealed carry handgun and, it, and it's it's yeah. happening you know women um, local shooting ranges are having they're like, catering to women catering too to women. that's yeah. what the article says they're um, catering to all these women and, yeah. and and that's that's fine and there are more women carrying concealed weapons yeah definitely you know that's especially here in the valley you know there's a probably more people in the valley that have concealed carry permits than anywhere else in the state yeah um, but you got to imagine a lot of them are women yeah, it's amazing. So, so, so I want to know why. I, and maybe we'll talk about that when we come back. Why aren't men buying Lexus? I mean, it's a nice car. Well, you know, according to Karen, about it's about half and half now. When men purchasing and women purchasing, um, it just maybe is, Lexus is not a man's car. I don't know. I don't know. They're pretty darn nice. I'd be happy to own one if I could afford one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me too. I don't know. But uh, anyway, we're talking with Gabriel Dillard. The Business Journal has two very nice articles today. Uh, it's come, you know, this is the, uh, the latest edition talking about the truck fires and also Fresno Lexus here at the bottom below the fold talking about how women making up 68% of all car sales. I would assume that's across the country. All right, back with our program, 436, Me TV Option 11. Dr. Thomas Casagrande is our sponsor today. Back in a moment. Whether you're 5 or 65, Dr. Thomas Casagrande will get to know you, your lifestyle, and vision needs to ensure that your contacts or eyeglasses are a perfect fit and the right prescription every time. With the Valley's largest selection of eyewear, 2020 has over 2,000 frames, including top designer brands like Coach, Tiffany, Prada, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and more. Eye exams start as low as $89, so call or stop by to schedule your appointment today. Ventura TV Appliance Center. We're the save energy, save time, save money place. The Energy Star qualified number one rated high efficiency cabrio from Whirlpool Place. You heard right. Right now, save big on select Whirlpool cabrio laundry pairs and pay no interest when paid in full within six months. At the hometown low price, think outside the big box place. Since 1951, Ventura TV Appliance Center, we're working hard to be your place. find out once and for all about Clark Kent, the Superman. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's a TV show. Yes, but who is he? What's his name? He's Superman. Golly, Clark, won't that be wonderful seeing Superman? Fighting a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and television the Me TV way. No one can do the things that Superman does. The Adventures of Superman. Now on Me TV Fresno, Xfinity 187. Back here on the program, uh, you're watching us on Comcast, channel 187, 436, 131, and now 8.1. You can call in at th uh, 436, Me TV option 11. Gabe Dillard is here, and he's from the Business Journal. And let me ask you about another story that appears in the paper, talking about e-cigarettes. And um, so the controversy, as I understand just reading the story, is the fact that they want to put the same regulations on these cigarettes as they do tobacco cigarettes. Why? Right. Um, well, e-cigarettes, as, as they currently are, you know, sold and, and, and used across the country, they're, they're unregulated. No, nobody's overseen how they're how they're made, so we're not sure what's. I thought they were harmless. They're not. They're not. <laughs> they're they're not full of tobacco. Well, well, they have nicotine. You know, a lot of them. Uh, there right. might be some that are non-nicotine, but I, I think but they're non-tobacco. Right? Yeah, I thought tobacco was the enemy. Oh, no, right. You know, there's chemicals in tobacco, but there's also chemicals in these. It's called e-juice. It's just liquid, and, yeah. and you're vaporizing it. Um, I don't know if there's been enough research to, to know conclusively if there's um, harm there, but you know, a lot of people are really concerned. I mean, there's 
today there's more high school students smoking e-cigarettes than there are actual cigarettes, you know, tobacco cigarettes. That's, that's, isn't that kind of alarming it, it in is, a way? It is. And, you know, if you, you're out, you know, I, my, I was on Fresno City campus the other day and I saw somebody kind of puffing on one of these. And You see them more and more like in restaurants and stuff like that too. There's question on it's harmful secondhand sort of people taking it in secondhand. Um, but yeah, they, they wanted to, there's a bill in Sacramento to, to classify them as tobacco. Um, and it, it was a Senate bill, went to an assembly committee, and um, assembly member Henry T. Perea was one of the uh, the lawmakers who essentially kind of put the, the kibosh on this bill. They, they put a stop to it. Um, I wonder why. Well, uh, the Sacramento Bee did an editorial kind of blasting uh, um, Perea for this and it's because he apparently has accepted maybe like twenty five, twenty seven thousand dollars worth of uh big tobacco campaign or, or donations to, mm -hmm. to his office. Um uh, a representative of Perea said that was outlandish to suggest that it was a quid pro quo sort of thing where the money kinda did the talking there for for the lobbyists but um yeah, essentially I, I think they just started adding amendments and, and the, the person who was carrying the bill, Mark Leno San Francisco just said, "Oh, you know, screw it. Um, this bill's dead for now." But is this is this like smoking? Because I've never seen an e-cigarette. Never seen anyone smoke one. Is this like smoking a real cigarette? Is there is there real smoke coming out of these things? It's, and and, and can, can that smoke be just as harmful as a regular cigarette? Th there's questions on whether how harmful it is. It's not smoke. It's it's vapor. It's water vapor, but there, there's other things there's in There's nicotine in the, There's in nicotine the, in, in this stuff that you buy. You basically buy it in bottles, and you fill up your, your e-cigarette, and you puff on it. Um, but, you know, it, that, apparently there's stuff that they, they ingredients and, in like, uh, af, antifreeze and stuff like that. And the thing is, you don't know what's in this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's going to be any backlash on, on Perea? Uh, well, you know, the, the the Sacramento Bee took him to task. You know, he, he maybe just wasn't comfortable with, with the broad characterization of of those as tobacco. Maybe, maybe there's a lot of research left to be done. But, you know, he's he's uh, terming out this year, so I'm not sure w what the sort of uh, circumstances might be. I'm not sure what his next move is. But Yeah, where is he going to go politically at this point if he's if he's termed out? Is he coming back here to Fresno to run for mayor again, or is he going to run know. for Congress? That's a good question. <laughs> um, we don't know, but certainly politicians get, you know, antsy and they get really nervous when, uh, you know, those allegations are leveled toward them. Well, you took money from this group, so therefore you're voting in this certain way. And those are the allegations against uh, Henry T. at this point. And you know how, well, he has not been a guest on this program, but he appeared to be in that in that mayor's race quite a few years ago, really thin-skinned. Yeah, from reports you hear, you know, as far as once the the results were out, kind of shutting the media out. I think that well, those were the allegations. Um, yeah. Who knows? You know. It, to be, if you weren't in his shoes, maybe you'd understand. But I, yeah, he's been on the. But he wasn't a gracious loser, let's say, to when when right. Swearingen won won the leadership role here in Fresno. That was pretty early in his career. You know, that might have been yeah. his second or third ele um, uh, election. You know, his, several years later today, he's he's kind of been on the state spotlight. Um, I'd imagine he he probably takes a loss a little bit better, a little more gracefully these days. I'd I'd hope. Yeah. Hey, it's good to see you again. Uh, we're going to see you back, I think, in September. And I, I, always, I love your paper. You know, I read it online, actually. But we get it here at the uh, at Ventura TV. And this is the latest issue. Uh, the Business Journal got the truck fires there. Interesting. And also the Fresno Lexus. Women are buying cars more than men. Gabe, good to see you. You too. Hey, great. Have a good week. You we'll too. see you back here um, after the new school year starts. How's that? Thanks, John. And we'll talk about the Business Journal and some of the stories in there. And we're going to see you back here tomorrow. You know what we're talking about tomorrow? Texting and driving. And also what's called text neck. When you're like bending over like this, problem for your neck. All right. See you tomorrow here on Connect With Me. Have a great day.